name is Toddy Steelman, and I'm the Dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment here at Duke University. And it is my enormous uh, pleasure to introduce, you, introduce to you tonight Dr. Ryan Emanuel. Um, Ryan is coming to us tonight from North Carolina State University, where he is an associate professor in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources. Um, he also runs the Ecohydrology and Watershed Science Lab at, uh, in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources at uh, NC State. Um, that's one part of Ryan's life, <laughs> the part you're probably not here to hear about tonight. Um, Ryan is also a registered member of the Lumbee tribe, and he is a very strong advocate for indigenous rights and an award-winning um, advocate uh, in terms of trying to heighten awareness about indigenous rights of American Indians uh, in science and technology and a variety of other avenues. And I think we're really fortunate to have you here with us tonight, Ryan, in many different ways. And you can see from the literally standing room only crowd that you have drawn in. Um, so we're really privileged to have you here. I also, um, prior to coming to Duke, I had the honor of actually serving on the faculty with Ryan at North Carolina State University. And I can tell you that he is a valued colleague, he is an outstanding teacher, and he, and he is an exemplary scientist. So he, he wears many, many different hats. And I hope you will uh, join me in welcoming Ryan and for his talk tonight that he's going to give us on indigenous rights, environmental justice, and the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Toddy, and thank you all for coming out. I'm really grateful uh, to see so many friendly faces here and, and new faces as well. So I'd like to start by acknowledging where we are this evening. We're here on the traditional territories of the Saponi and Tutelo and many other indigenous peoples. Uh, today, uh, we are in the homelands of three contemporary tribes in North Carolina. Uh, the Saponi, the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, and the Halawa Saponi. So I put up these photos. Uh, just representative photos from each of these uh, three tribes. And I pull these photos uh, because I try to be deliberate about uh, breaking stereotypes that our indigenous nations are somehow locked in, in a stereotypical past. Uh, you can see that the, the Saponi tribe hosts an annual uh, trail run up at, at Mayo Lake, and they're very proud of that uh, event. It's tied into a youth camp that they run every year. Uh, this photo from the Okanichi Band of Saponi Nation uh, comes from a healthy native North Carolinians uh, food initiative that they're partnering with UNC Chapel Hill on. Uh, Halawa Saponi students have their own uh, charter school. It's a reconstitution of a segregation era uh, tribal school uh, in Hollister, North Carolina. And here are some high school students there uh, testing water from an historic spring uh, behind the school. So uh, Durham and Duke are, are literally surrounded by, by Native nations, and it's important to start by acknowledging that. Uh, Duke's footprint and its, its relationship with Native nations is not uh, solely isolated to those nations in the immediate vicinity. Uh, when I was going away to Duke as a freshman, my father told me, uh, remember the, the Duke fortune and the Duke family uh, uh, built their reputation, they built their capacity for philanthropy um, off of tobacco farmers across the South. And uh, my family were tobacco farmers in Robinson County. And he said, just remember that. Uh, the, the poet and farmer Wendell Berry tells a, a beautiful story about confronting the statue of James B. Duke on West Campus in his uh, essay, for the National Endowment for the Humanities Jefferson Lecture in 2012. And he articulates that much better uh, than I do. But I, I juxtapose a picture of a traditional Lumbee tobacco farm uh, against the, the statue of James B. Duke so that we can remember this. Uh, this is the Lumbee River. This is where I come from. This is my home. Uh, it's black water. So as a hydrologist, uh, one of the things that I study is what's in the water. 
So we call this a black water stream. We call this full of dissolved organic matter. Some of the same material that you would find in iced tea. And indeed, it has the color of iced tea if you pull up a, a cup of it out of the water. Doesn't mean it's dirty, that's its natural color. So are many of the streams that have their headwaters in the coastal plain, like the Lumbee River. It's flanked by these wide, expansive floodplain uh, forests. And one of the dominant tree species is the bald cypress. And so here you can see bald cypress knees in the foreground, this very unique uh, plant organ. And then in the background, you can see mature bald cypress trees standing there uh, in an island in the middle of the Lumbee River. But this is a very, uh, very typical scene for my people. It's important to us for a variety of reasons. Uh, for spirituality, many Lumbee people adopted the, the Christian religion two or 300 years ago, and they continue to practice Christian baptisms in the river in some of the same places uh, where their ancestors have been baptizing for centuries. So although this photograph was taken during the mid 20th century, you might find a very similar scene taking place uh, today along some of the same spots on the river. The Lumbee River was also a hideout. During the Civil War, uh, Henry Barry Lowry watched his father and brothers executed by the Confederate Home Guard. Uh, he swore revenge on the people who killed his family members, and he spent the next eight or so years uh, waging guerrilla warfare with his band against first the Confederate government <laughs> and later against the United States government which in Robeson County happened to be the same people just wearing different hats before and after uh, the end of the war. At one point, Henry Barry Lowry had the largest bounty on his head in the history of the United States. He was never caught or captured. One of the common stories about what happened to him is that uh, he accidentally shot and killed himself while cleaning his gun at one of his swamp hideouts and his band members, his gang, uh, secretly buried his body uh, in the swamps in order for no one to claim his body and thereby taking the, the bounty. And so for many Lumbee people, the entirety of the river represents Henry Barry Lowry's burial place. Uh, zoom forward almost 100 years. In January of 1958, the Ku Klux Klan publicly announced that they were going to hold a rally in Robeson County to put Lumbee people in their place. Uh, they rented a field near a town called Maxton, and on a Saturday night in January of 1958, about 50 Klansmen gathered. Uh, they set up a PA system a light bulb, and a generator to power the affair. And when they started the generator and lit up the scene, between four and 500 armed Lumbees uh, and allies came out of the surrounding swamp, surrounded the Klansmen, and drove them from the field. Amazingly, no, nobody was seriously injured in this event, which, which is called the Battle of Hayes Pond. If you want to read more about it, you can look up the Battle of Hayes Pond. Another really interesting thing is that national media were tipped off that this was happening. So not only was this an amazing event where the Ku Klux Klan was routed out of Robeson County, uh, but it's very well documented in the photographic record. Here's a photograph on the left-hand side of the actual scuffle in the dark, only lit up by a photographer's flash. Uh, and you can see uh, there's a, a man pulling a microphone stand away from another, uh, another man. Uh, the, the news of this made uh, the national news wires, it made international news, and congratulatory messages poured into the Lumbee community from all over the world. Uh, on the right-hand side, two of the leaders of the Battles of Hayes Pond uh, were photographed at local newspaper uh, offices later that evening after this event had happened. And you can see they're holding the, the spoils of, of the battle that they took away from the battlefield. Uh, these two men had driven down from Charlotte. They were at a VFW convention. So World War II veterans uh, coming to, to stand up for, uh, for their homelands and for their people. And you can see the you can see the VFW logo on the, the hat of the man on the right. That's my great uncle, Simeon Oxendine. 
Just last year, the state of North Carolina put up a commemorative marker, some 60 years later, uh, commemorating the Battle of Hayes Pond. So now we have uh, this marker that we can go and visit just outside the small town uh, of Maxton. But I tell you this to show you how important not only the river, but also the wetlands, the swamps, these forests that surround the river, how important they are for us historically, culturally, and strategically. Even today, uh, Lumbee people, Tuscarora people, uh, and others who live along the Lumbee River continue to uh, recreate in much the same way that our ancestors did. This photo was taken last summer, or maybe two summers ago, at a spot called Wiregrass on the river. This is now part of North Carolina State Park System, but is a historic swimming hole. It is also a known place where Henry Barry Lowry had a shootout with a federal militia. And so there's deep historical ties to these exact places along the Lumbee River. By the way, this is not a weekend or a holiday. This is just midday during the week in the summer. This is, this is what we do. If we zoom away and we take a look at the Lumbee River watershed, uh, we can use tools like land cover or satellite imagery to try and understand from a scientific perspective what this watershed looks like. Uh, what are the different types of landscapes that make up this watershed? Uh, in the upper left, the northwest, you see a lot of green. Those are predominantly pine forests of the sand hills. So that's where the river's headwaters are. As you move down from left to right, from northwest to southeast, you begin to see a lot of browns. Those are cultivated crop fields. But the thing I want to draw your attention to is in every part of this watershed, throughout the landscape, you have these light blue ribbons. Those are the riparian forests. So we would call those the swamps. Those are those wide forested floodplains that I showed you in the very first photograph. Uh, the, some of them are along the Lumbee River itself, and others are along tributaries of the river. If we zoom in even further, this boxed area shows you that there are even smaller wetlands. So wetlands within wetlands. And we often think about the coastal plain as a flat agricultural landscape, right? When you're driving to the beach, you're driving north or south along the eastern seaboard. But really, if we look carefully at this image, we see that the natural texture of the landscape, if you will, is defined by these light blue ribbons that run through the landscape. So the natural grain of the landscape is from northwest to southeast, but our highways tend to cut across at right angles. So we see farm fields and we see croplands punctuated by occasional dips in the landscape. Those dips are actually us crossing the natural flow of the land at 90 degree angles. And uh, maybe a better way to think about this is we have these islands of crop fields and farmlands that float in a sea of wetlands, figuratively, of course. Um, so I've done a little bit of work looking at the role of these wetlands in creating an, an isolated landscape that, uh, that protects or historically protected Lumbee people uh, from outsiders. We have a rich oral tradition that says that our ancestors migrated to this place in the 1700s or even earlier to get away from the onslaught of colonization. There's strong oral tradition, not only in my tribe, but in other tribes in the coastal plain that we found these places as, as refuges to the onslaught of settler colonialism. And I was curious about that and wanted to turn a scientist's eye to it. So I went to the Wilson Library at UNC and found that they had nearly 100 historical maps of North Carolina. And for each one of these maps, I decided to see how good a job the map makers uh, did at identifying the Lumbee River. Because I thought, if these maps are made by colonial powers, if these maps are made by the state, and they didn't know that Lumbee people were there, they didn't know that the Lumbee River is located where it is, they probably wouldn't map it very accurately. 
Now, what I didn't want to do is penalize older map makers for not having GPS and satellite data. So I had to come up with a completely different scoring system or <laughs> ranking system, if you will. So I created a rubric. If you've ever graded exams or papers, you have to have a rubric. So my rubric is the figure across the bottom here, and it, it's called a topological map. So it's not interested in latitude and longitude. It's interested in how rivers and their tributaries are connected one to another. And so I looked at these different levels of connectivity from the Atlantic Ocean up to the Great PD River, the Little PD River, the Lumbee River, and its headwaters. And I figured out a way to score each one of these levels of accuracy on a, on a zero to four scale. So if a, if a map doesn't even show the Great PD River, which is the trunk river that the Lumbee flows into, it gets a zero. And the map on the upper left is a version, an early version of a colonial map that doesn't even have the Great PD River. I know this because the other rivers are named on here. None of them has any kind of name matching the Great PD River, let alone uh, geographical accuracy. And this map, the area that is probably the Lumbee uh, River region, has actually some kind of mythical beast in it. It's some kind of a lion with, with horns. Okay, so this is just terra incognita on this map. And as you move through history, you find that the maps get more and more accurate. They identify the Little PD River, the Lumbee River, but they tend to take its headwaters and transpose it into a different basin. Very strange. And this has to do with the fact that the river was not navigable by settler colonial boats from the ocean up to the headwaters. You would either have to have a small craft like a canoe to navigate this river, or you have to get, get out and walk. And both of those presented challenges to colonial map makers. Uh, and so I went through and I scored all 96 of these maps. And then I, I'm only going to show you a couple of, I'll call them data-rich figures. But one of the data-rich figures I want to show you uh, is how these different scores played out by the date that the map was published. So I'm going to show you here, this is the score of the map, and this axis is the range of years that achieved a certain score. And what you see is, we expect the scores get more accurate, so the maps get more accurate as time elapses. Uh, but one thing that was surprising to me is that maps don't get reasonably accurate here until after the year 1800. That's very unusual, in my opinion, for a river that's only 60 or 80 miles from the Atlantic Ocean. We tend to think of, of colonialism as a wave that marches uh, like a solid line across the continent but it really didn't happen that way according to, according to this analysis. There are pockets of isolation that were left over. And so I show you this not to replace our oral tradition, but to show you that there are other ways uh, of, of thinking about things and analyzing things. I wanna show you one little way that uh, scientific analyses complements the oral tradition. And so one of the effects of this isolation in the Lumbee community was to allow us to create our own institutions and our own cultures. On the left, there is the very first version of the institution that became UNC Pembroke. It began as a teacher training school uh, for American Indians. Uh, unique styles of tobacco farming. So here's my father on the upper right holding up a a stick of tobacco that he found left behind in a barn after about 50 or 60 years. And then in the bottom, we have unique ways of organizing our communities. So this is about a 10 acre uh, field that my great grandparents farmed outside of Pembroke. And they uh, left it to their children and they left it to their children. And each successive generation subdivided the property on paper but the generations built their home places around the edges of this field, and to this day, we continue to cultivate it uh, in commons by, by one of our relatives. And that's fairly common uh, throughout indigenous communities in this part of the world. 
but there are threats. One of the threats to uh, lumby culture, one of the threats to our way of uh, agriculture, our way of sustaining ourselves is climate change. So some of the work that I've done recently looks at the most recent climate projections that have been produced by models and compares it to historic climate data. So when we look at air temperature from the 1990s and we compare it to projected air temperatures in the, in the 2060s, we're looking to see about a six degree Fahrenheit increase in average air temperature during the hottest months of the year, July and August. There's been a lot of scientific discussion lately about warming winter temperatures or warming nighttime temperatures. And these are major concerns, but just the fact that average temperature is warming up during these hot summer months, which can already be in the 90s Fahrenheit, uh, that is a, a major concern. One of the concerns for Lumbee people, apart from things like heat-related illness, high energy costs, things like this, uh, is the impact on our major cultural festival, Lumbee Homecoming, which happens the four, around the 4th of July every year uh, since 1970. And so there is a reason why most of the festivities end by about 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday is because it is so hot, okay? Now, add six degrees Fahrenheit to that experience uh, and, and it becomes, it becomes a, a, a major game changer for this type of act, outdoor activity. So I throw that out there because I wanna show you that some of the impacts go far beyond the things that we typically talk about, heat-related illness, energy, crop productivity, things like that. Uh, and another game changer when it comes to uh, discussions of climate change in our community are, are the storms that we have just experienced. Hurricane Matthew, 2016. Hurricane Florence, 2018. We're starting to see research come about to, to link the amount of rain that these storms dropped to uh, climate change, the atmosphere's capacity to hold more water and to create these storms that, that have unprecedented amounts of rainfall. 20 inches, 30 inches of rain, a very short period of time. Uh, the infrastructure in cities like Lumberton gets a lot of attention, but the rural infrastructure is also heavily impacted and it usually takes longer to come back around and be repaired. So here's my, my father making his second cameo, uh, standing over a washed out culvert uh, between his house and church. And what is normally a five minute drive ended up being about a 25 minute drive for about a year, because that's about how long it took uh, before this culvert was repaired and many other culverts across Eastern North Carolina. So there's a whole other infrastructure story once you get outside of cities and towns into the countryside. Uh, so when we think about the equity of climate change impacts, we also have to think about images like this. This is a, a newspaper adaptation of a paper that came out in 2017 that showed on a county by county basis across the United States, uh, how much of a county's gross domestic product or its income is going to be spent dealing with the negative impacts of climate change. So you see a lot of red on here. Red is bad. Red means that a, a county is spending more of its income to deal with the impacts of climate change. This could be agriculture, human health, storm-related infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, but I want to point out that some of the, the, the deepest shades of red are located in, in poor southern counties. And in North Carolina, Robeson County, home of the Lumbee tribe, tops the list. About 11% of the county's gross domestic product is expected to be expended dealing with the impacts of climate change by the end of this century. I've redisplayed one cool thing about this paper is they put all their data online and allow people to download and manipulate uh, as they wish. So I've pulled these data down for North Carolina counties. I've plotted it as the county's income, so how rich or poor is the county on the horizontal axis and how much of the county's income is going to be spent dealing with climate change on the y-axis. Uh, and the colors represent our economic tiers. Tier one are the, the, the poorest third of the counties. 
tier three or the wealthiest third of the counties. You can see a stark inequity here. The poorest counties on average are going to spend more of their, their income dealing with climate change. Now, some of this is because wealthier counties have more income, and so there's more flexibility in what they're going to be able to do to, to deal with these impacts. So there is some, some cross-correlation there for you mathematically inclined. Uh, but I want to point out that Robinson County is sitting out there all by itself at 11% loss. So we're, we're talking about some major impacts in terms of dollars, and we're talking about affecting uh, rural and poor counties more than others. When I look at a map of inequities across North Carolina, I can't help bringing this image into my mind. So this is a map that shows where the tribal nations in North Carolina are located today. This does not speak to our historical territories. It only speaks to the, the counties where most of our tribes uh, deliver services to their enrolled citizens today. So each one of these colors represents a different tribal nation. Red is Eastern Band of Cherokee, orange, is the Okanichi Band of Saponi, pink is Saponi, uh, Duke Blue is Halawa Saponi, brown, Meharan, green is Kahari, light blue is uh, Lumbee, and purple is Wakamal Suwan. The four yellow counties are urban Indian organizations. These are cities that have large American Indian populations, and all of these color uh, of counties have representation on a group called the North Carolina Commission of Indian Affairs. This is part of the state government that advocates for uh, well-being uh, of American Indian people throughout the state. And so if you juxtapose that map of climate impacts over where tribal nations are located, you can see that uh, some of these tribal nations are going to be seriously impacted uh, by climate change. Now, Eastern North Carolina in particular is known as a birthplace of the modern environmental justice movement. This is a photograph from Warren County in northeastern North Carolina. In the early 1980s, the state of North Carolina decided to locate a PCB landfill there. The backstory actually connects to my home in Raleigh, uh, a company that disassembled electrical transformers, aggregated liquid uh, PCB waste, and that waste was supposed to be taken to the Northeast for disposal uh, at, a, at a facility. But instead, these tanker trucks drove along hundreds of miles of rural unpaved roads in Eastern North Carolina. And in the middle of the night, they opened the valves and let out PCB into the roadside ditches all across Eastern North Carolina. That company was, was punished, but the state was still left with the waste to deal with. And the state unilaterally decided to place that landfill in the predominantly African-American community of Afton. Uh, and so this is widely considered to be the birthplace of the modern environmental justice movement. It was a combination of local community, civil rights organizations, and religious organizations coming together to advocate for the fair treatment of communities like this and to stop, uh, to stop dumping waste on them, to be frank, without their informed consent. What's not often told is this landfill is located about 10 or 15 miles from Hollister, which is the seat of the Hollowasapote Nation. So when I saw uh, some of the first sketches of where the Atlantic Coast Pipeline was going to run, which you see on the left, that map came right back into my mind, map of tribal nations in eastern North Carolina. Uh, and so I was anxious in tw late 2016, early 2017, to see how tribal nations were represented in the draft environmental impact statement that was published by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I got no further than the executive summary, and I came across this statement. Environmental justice populations would not be disproportionately affected by the projects. And I said, huh. Let me dig into the technical details to see how tribal nations are not disproportionately affected uh, by this project. And it turns out that uh, their, their reasoning is based on, on faulty mathematical analysis. And so when I ran the numbers, and the numbers were easy to run because buried in the 20th or 21st appendix, 
uh, I came across a table of demographic data used in their analysis. So I was able to lift the entire table and put it into my analytical software and, and run the numbers. Uh, so North Carolina has an American Indian population of approximately 1.2%. The counties that federal regulators use as their reference area for determining whether or not there are disproportionate impacts on poor or minority people uh, have an American Indian population of 6%. And the census tracts that they use to define the study area have an American Indian population of 13%. So if we want to talk about disproportionality, it's as simple as that. And so I included this infographic along with about 12 or 15 pages of technical discussion to outline uh, why it's important to use weighted averages when you're working with census data. That turned out to be one of the key errors in their analysis, is that they assumed every census tract has the exact same population. When populations range from a minimum of 11 in some tracts to nearly 10,000 in other tracts, so multiple orders of magnitude. Uh, I, I actually didn't receive a response to that criticism. And that criticism has yet to be addressed uh, by federal regulators. I tried other models too. You know, I tried lots of different visualizations. I figured maybe my pie chart wasn't straightforward enough. You know, so I tried this, uh, orange, oranges and grapes. Okay, so the oranges are census tracts that have disproportionately large minority populations. Grapes are census tracts that do not. Regulators say there are more grapes than oranges, so there is no disproportionate impact on minority people. That is, that is a concise summary of the logic of their environmental justice analysis. And the, the goal of that analysis is to identify whether that or not there are disproportionately large numbers of minority populations within a study area compared to a reference area. The second part of that environmental justice directive is to address those disproportionate impacts to the extent that they are available. And that last clause opens up a very wide loophole, which basically means you're under no obligation to do anything about this, but you are on the hook for identifying disproportionate impacts. You, there's no question about that. Um, so I took, this, um, I took this message to tribal communities, to indigenous organizations, to other levels of decision makers to try and uh, raise awareness about this issue. You, know, the, you have a federal decision-making document that says there is no environmental justice issue, uh, yet the numbers show that there clearly is. And there's a good reason uh, to, to pay attention to this analysis and to do the analysis right and to address the impacts. So something that I wrote in this short piece up here on the right is, all parties suffer when environmental justice analyses and tribal consultations are treated as meaningless or rote exercises. Tribes suffer erosion of their sovereignty and damage to cultural landscapes. Federal and tribal relations deteriorate and developers incur setbacks. We're seeing some of those setbacks now as this project is approximately three years behind schedule. And, and billions of dollars over budget. Uh, so what do I mean by tribal consultation? It turns out that in addition to carrying out environmental justice analyses, regulators have a directive to engage with tribes in the, in the decision-making process. They're supposed to gather input uh, from American Indian tribes. It turns out that there are two levels uh, of requirements. There are statutory requirements for engaging with federally recognized tribes. The National Historic Preservation Act and NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, both explain how agencies are supposed to engage formally with tribes. With non-federally recognized tribes, like most of the ones that I have shown you in Eastern North Carolina, there is no statutory requirement. There is only guidance. Guidance isn't the letter of the law, so you're left at the mercy of the agency. Uh, the advisory bodies that put out recommendations on how federal agencies are supposed to interact with tribes, right around this time, they publish a brand new guidance document on how to engage with non-federally recognized tribes. And in that document, one of the example tribes that they use is the Lumbee tribe. So the exact tribe that's at the center 
of this discussion about consultation is being used as, as an example by the body that's putting out guidance for what consultation is supposed to look like. Uh, yet the agency said that since there was no statutory requirement to engage in consultation, they would not do that. Uh, we also have international standards to draw from. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has some very specific language about uh, the need to obtain free, prior, and informed consent from Indigenous peoples before undertaking development activities on their traditional or contemporary territories. And they pay special attention to development activities that are extractive in nature, fossil fuel extracting, mining, transport of fossil fuels, things like this. Uh, the United States originally declined to sign uh, this declaration. In 2007, only four countries in the world declined to sign on to this UN declaration. The US, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. The US finally signed on in 2010. In 2010, we said as a nation, we will agree to abide by this. So how did tribes respond? Uh, my tribe, the Lumbee tribe, uh, issued a resolution calling on uh, decision makers and regulators to rescind any permits that have been issued without formal tribal consultation. The North Carolina Commission of Indian Affairs issued a very similar resolution calling on state and federal governments to pull back these permits until you had gone through and pursued formal consultation with these tribes. National Congress of American Indians, which speaks on behalf of hundreds of tribes across the United States, weighed in and asked for the same thing. Last year, the regulatory agency that oversees this pipeline and other pipelines opened up uh, their policy for general comments. And they said, we hear that there are some issues that you have with the way we regulate pipelines. We would like to hear from you. And the thousands and thousands of comments they receive, I found this, I, I didn't read thousands and thousands of comments. Thankfully, you can search for keywords. Uh, but I found a, a very nice comment by the United South and Eastern Tribes, which represents a number of uh, federally recognized tribes in the South and East part of the US. And they had a very pithy statement. Only tribal nations can provide an accurate and acceptable assessment of the potential impact of a proposed project on cultural properties of concern to them. So this is a summary of why it's important for government agencies to engage in consultation with tribes. So you can't expect an agency that has no expertise in the culture and environmental concerns of your people to carry out an accurate environmental assessment without even talking to you. Yet that's, that's what's happening in this case. And so why is this important? Why do we care that our voices are included in things like this? I pulled this filing. This is a report that was filed by uh, the developers with the Federal Regulatory Agency, and it's based on some of their archaeological surveys. And so they're running archaeological surveys through ancestral territories of Lumbee people, Tuscarora people, Saponi, Tudlo, all of these other native nations. And for Cumberland County, adjacent to Robeson County, they say, Eastern North Carolina was largely a province of squatters, runaways, and outlaws for decades before the Tuscarora were driven out in the Tuscarora War, which ended in 1715. Nearly all left the area, moving to upstate New York. I had to look up this 1973 citation. It's a, it's a history reference book from North Carolina that was published in 1973. So that, that's what we're working with. Uh, and then skip down a paragraph. The area that is now Cumberland County was first settled in 1720. So that's the erasure uh, of the original peoples of this place. And this is why it's important uh, to include indigenous perspectives in these decision-making documents, because now when we begin to talk about cultural or architectural preservation of these landscapes, if a pipeline is going to be built, we're only looking for structures or cultural sites of importance after 1720. So does this matter? Are there sites from before 1720? Indeed there are. So this is from an issue of Southern Indian Studies published by 
uh, what's now the research labs of archaeology at UNC Chapel Hill. Southern Indian Studies devoted a special issue in 1966 to the excavation and study of a burial mound in Cumberland County. More than 100 sets of human remains were dug up from this mound and shipped to the Smithsonian Institution in cardboard boxes, cartons, and fruit baskets, but mainly in shoe boxes. So once those remains reached the Smithsonian, they were deemed to be in such poor condition that except for a few specimens, they were all thrown in the garbage. So that goes to show um, that we need to think about whose history we're telling. So where do we go from here? I want to try to end on a positive note. Uh, we know that federal regulators don't have to fix environmental injustices, but they do have to acknowledge them. We've also learned that indigenous knowledge can fill major gaps in the expertise by regulators and developers during the decision-making process. So we know that we need to be doing these things if we want to make an honest and good faith effort at assessing environmental impacts of proposed activities. Uh, one of the things that my group has been doing is actually a more detailed mathematical deconstruction of this demographic test that's pervasive in almost every pipeline environmental review. A uh, version of it was present in the environmental review for the Dakota Access Pipeline, and the Army Corps of Engineers used that analysis to say that there are no disproportionate impacts on American Indians related to Dakota Access Pipeline. And what you're looking at here are demographic variables shown in, a, in probability space. So this is just a mathematical representation of all the census data that's used uh, in the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. And my group took this information and we embedded it in a special type of modeling method called a Monte Carlo simulation. That's where we use this information to create millions of virtual worlds. Each world has a randomized population, but they all maintain the exact same statistical properties of the original. And this is cool because for each one of these millions of worlds, we can actually run the federal regulators test and we can assess how many times out of 5 million they were able to pick up a disproportionately large American Indian population. And moreover, we, we artificially seeded extra American Indians in all these census tracts to figure out how large the population would have to be in order for this test to, to give a positive result. And the, re the results were disappointing, but unsurprising. It turns out for demographic conditions that match the Atlantic Coast Pipeline precisely, the test has a 0% accuracy rate. In, in statistical terms, we would say it's a 100% false negative error rate. So a false negative is uh, when the doctor tells you you don't have cancer, but you really do. So this test is incapable of detecting disproportionately large American Indian populations at the level that we observe in real life. But if we increase the number of American Indians in the study area, we find that the accuracy finally drops to an acceptable level when you have about four times as many American Indians living in the study area as in the reference area. So say your reference area is 5% American Indian. You would need 20% American Indian population in the study area across the entire 600 miles of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline in order for this analysis to work. It's not very encouraging. It's not feasible. It's not possible to achieve that anywhere in the United States. And since we had so many millions of realizations, we were able to come up with some general rules and test this across the entire United States. And we found that on a state-by-state -state basis, between about 25% and 45% of all the census tracts uh, in each state had disproportionately large American Indian populations that would not be detected by this test. So what does this tell us? tells us we need to throw this test out and stop using it, okay? So it's, it's, 
it's literally a, an instrument of invisibility. So in, in my community, we talk about fighting invisibility. And we had a discussion uh, today about invisibility on Duke's campus. This is invisibility writ large and, and written into federal policy. So some things that I've done to fight invisibility, I've worked with other Lumbee tribal members to present our tribal council with a report calling for um, a culturally relevant assessment of the pipeline. Now this, these are reasons why it's important uh, to do an assessment from our perspective. This starts from the way that we see the world and our values. And moreover, have that assessment incorporated into a formal decision-making process. Uh, there's also been a lot of uh, media attention and, and public visibility of this issue. Some gets it right, uh, some not so much, uh, but you know, it's, it's bringing attention and it's raising awareness about this issue. And we, have, we get to have these conversations about invisibility, environmental justice, and the rights of indigenous peoples. So in that, I think that these are all, uh, all positive developments. Um, as a scholar, I'm still working on where to take this next, but as a Lumbee person, um, I don't feel as conflicted about it. I know exactly where I'm going, and um, I think this is where I'm supposed to be. So I want to end with a quote uh, from what was the definitive history book on Lumbee people until Melinda Maynard Lowry began publishing over at UNC Chapel Hill, and her books are now part of this canon of Lumbee history. But in 1975, a uh, Lumbee professor at UNC Pembroke named Adolph Dial and his colleague David Eliades published a book called The Only Land I Know. And the end of that book uh, focused on Old Main, the oldest brick structure on UNC Pembroke's campus. It was burned uh, to, a, to a brick hull by arsonists in the early 1970s. And during this time, excuse me, during this time, uh, there was a lot of discussion about what was gonna happen with this burned out shell. Were we gonna raise it over and, and build something new and better? In the Lumbee community, this building was a symbol uh, of, of the fact that that university came from our community. It was originally our teacher training school. Uh, and I like this quote, it has to do with saving Old Main as a building. Uh, it says there's more than one way to own a thing. Some of the most precious things were not bought and paid for with money. And that's an ethical statement that comes from a Lumbee-centered point of view. And the, the woman who said that, Ms. Uh, Ruth Revels, passed away a couple of years ago, but her family thought it would also be appropriate to apply that statement to the way we view the environment. And interestingly, uh, Ms. Ruth is a person who invited me to come alongside the Commission of Indian Affairs when they formed their Environmental Justice Committee about four or five years ago. And I didn't come across this quote until after she passed away, but I thought it was an interesting connection, at least for my journey through environmental justice. And so with that, I'd like to thank the elders and collaborators and partners who have helped me with this work. And I wanna thank all of you for coming out and listening. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's awesome. Uh, so my question is that how would be, how would the constructors of the pipeline answer the question like why us? Why the pipeline has to pass through Lambie River? And yeah, so people asked that question early on, and they were told your community has to be the endpoint for this pipeline because this is where our existing infrastructure is. Now, what you don't hear in that story is the fact that existing infrastructure was put in place many decades ago, thank you, uh, before we had formal concepts of environmental justice. So we should start to ask the question, well, why was that infrastructure put there 50 years ago? And who got to, who got to make those decisions? And so that, that is how the discussion has shifted away from uh, environmental justice in the here and now. Hi. Um, I had a question about the beginning of your presentation. You sort of referenced the Lumbee River and um, um, uh, Drowning Creek and some other names that we see thrown about a lot. But if I look on a map, 
and I see that river, the name of it is the Lumber River. Would you talk a little bit about those that difference? Yeah, so I'm, I, I try to be a little provocative with this because in 2009, the Lumbee Tribal Council passed an ordinance uh, calling on all peoples to call the river by its ancestral name. And that's a name that our people have used since at least the late 1800s. That's when it entered the written record as Lumbee River. And you know we can have discussions about which came first, Lumber or Lumbee. But Lumbee is the, the indigenous name for the river. And the state and federal map makers um, officially call it the Lumber River to this day. Thank you for that. Thank you. That was incredible. Um, it's pretty amazing what the Atlantic Coast Pipeline is doing. I wondered if you could just cover briefly what's happening with the LNG storage facility in Robeson County and how that fits into this. Yeah, so I don't know a lot about this, but there is a liquefied natural gas storage facility that's planned for uh, another Lumbee community in Robeson County called Wakulla. And it's a few miles away from the Lumbee community that's supposed to house the terminus of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline prospect. Uh, it's being developed by the, the same people. It's being built to hold the exact same type of gas. Uh, but a few minutes before the public announcement last summer, a representative from the company called our tribal offices to make sure that they knew it didn't have anything to do with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. And so that, that's the, the official story is it has nothing to do with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, but it's just coincidental that this uh, 1.5 billion cubic foot liquefaction plant is being planned for you know, a few miles away from a pipeline that's also being planned uh, to carry the, the same material. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it seems to be moving, uh, moving forward without any engagement from, uh, from my tribe or from other indigenous peoples. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. Thank you for your awesome, awesome presentation. Really powerful. Um, just to con connect, make a con ask about a connection between a couple of the, the points you made: um, climate change and and the resistance to the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Um, I, I wonder if, if part of is is part of the way that the um, Lumbee people are um, framing your um, opposition to the pipeline. Um, does, that, does that include any um, cr critical um, reflections on, on the way that fossil fuels contribute to climate change and, and, and then conversely th thinking about alternative ways of life that indigenous peoples practice as alternatives to a, a fossil fuel based economy. Yeah, there are there are some discussions, certainly among in individual Lumbees and and individuals from from lots of different communities. These discussions are happening. Uh, they're not happening so much at the level of tribal governments or intertribal organizations like the Commission of Indian Affairs. They're learning about these connections. Uh, often learning about them in spite of alternative narratives that compare shale gas to coal, for example. Um, so there was an early push to, to, to establish the narrative that this was good for the climate because it would release us from the grips of coal. Uh, but there's, you know, there's, there are wide margins of uncertainty associated with rates of fugitive methane emissions from shale gas operations. And we can't, we can't say a whole lot about how much better than coal uh, it is. As far as alternatives, yeah, there are discussions about this in the community as well. Robinson County has the largest uh, investment by dollar amount in uh, renewable energies in North Carolina. Now, part of this is because it's one of the largest counties in North Carolina, so there's more places to put things like solar farms but it has something, um, I'm a, I'll mess the numbers up, but uh, RTI, Research Triangle Institute, put out a report a couple of years ago for um, renewable investments in each of the North Carolina counties, and Robinson was at the top of the list, and the vast majority of those investments were in solar farms. 
So it's interesting that we're target. We're also targeting this uh, alternative energy rich county for brand new fossil fuel development. So my question is that how would be, how would the constructors of the pipeline answer the question like why us? Why the pipeline has to pass through Lambe River and? Yeah, so people asked that question early on, and they were told, your community has to be the endpoint for this pipeline because this is where our existing infrastructure is. Now, what you don't hear in that story is the fact that existing infrastructure was put in place many decades ago Thank you. Uh, before we had formal concepts of environmental justice. So we should start to ask the question, well, why was that infrastructure put there 50 years ago? And who got to, who got to make those decisions? And so that, that is how the discussion has shifted away from uh, environmental justice in the here and now. Um, I had a question about the beginning of your presentation. You sort of referenced the Lumbee River and um, um, uh, Drowning Creek and some other names that we see thrown about a lot. But if I look on a map, and I see that river, the name of it is the Lumber River. Would you talk a little bit about those, that difference? Yeah, so I'm, I, I try to be a little provocative with this because in 2009, the Lumbee Tribal Council passed an ordinance uh, calling on all peoples to call the river by its ancestral name. And that's a name that our people have used since at least the late 1800s. That's when it entered the written record as Lumbee River. And you know we can have discussions about which came first, Lumber or Lumbee. But Lumbee is the, the indigenous name for the river, and the state and federal map makers um, officially call it the Lumber River to this day. Thank you for that. It's pretty amazing what the Atlantic Coast Pipeline is doing. I wondered if you could just cover briefly what's happening with the LNG storage facility in Robeson County and how that fits into this. Yeah. So. I don't know a lot about this, but there is a liquefied natural gas storage facility that's planned for uh, another Lumbee community in Robinson County called Wakulla. And it's a few miles away from the Lumbee community that's supposed to house the terminus of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline prospect. Uh, it's being developed by the, the same people. It's being built to hold the exact same type of gas uh, but a few minutes before the public announcement last summer, a representative from the company called our tribal offices to make sure that they knew it didn't have anything to do with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. And so that, that's the, the official story is it has nothing to do with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, but it's just coincidental that this uh, 1.5 billion cubic foot liquefaction plant is being planned for yeah, a few miles away from a pipeline that's also being planned uh, to carry the, the same material. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it seems to be moving, uh, moving forward without any engagement from, uh, from my tribe or from other indigenous peoples. Just to con connect, make a, ask about a connection between a couple of the, the points you made, um, climate change, and, and the resistance to the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Um, I, I wonder if, if part of, is, is part of the way that the um, Lumbee people are um, framing your um, opposition to the pipeline, um, does, that, does that include any um, cr critical um, reflections on, on the way that fossil fuels contribute to climate change and and, and then conversely, th thinking about alternative ways of life uh, that indigenous peoples practice as alternatives to a, a fossil fuel-based economy. Yeah, there are, there are some discussions, certainly among in individual Lumbees and, and individuals from, from lots of different communities, these discussions are happening. Uh, they're not happening so much at the level of tribal governments or intertribal organizations like the Commission of Indian Affairs. They're learning about these connections, uh, often learning about them in spite of alternative narratives that compare shale gas to coal, for example. Um, so there was an early push to, to, to establish the narrative that this was good for the climate because it would release us from the grips of coal uh, but there's 
you know, there's there are wide margins of uncertainty associated with rates of fugitive methane emissions from shale gas operations, and we can't we can't say a whole lot about how much better than coal uh, it is. As far as alternatives, yeah, there are discussions about this in the community as well. Robinson County has the largest uh, investment by dollar amount in uh, renewable energies in North Carolina. Now, part of this is because it's one of the largest counties in North Carolina, so there's more places to put things like solar farms. But it has something, um, I'm a, I'll mess the numbers up, but uh, RTI, Research Triangle Institute, put out a report a couple of years ago for um, renewable investments in each of the North Carolina counties, and Robinson was at the top of the list. And the vast majority of those investments were in solar farms. So it's interesting that we're target. We're also targeting this uh, alternative energy-rich county for brand new fossil fuel development. The segmentation is one of the cardinal sins of NEPA analysis. That is only looking at uh, you know individual segments, and again, in this case, ignoring the uh, the LNG facility that, at the end of the line that's disconnected and not connected in any way with this project, which just happens to be right nearby. Um, there, there seems to also be this other issue that's there of burying data in the numbers in your disappearance um, analogy. And I wondered if there is any thought about going and approaching either the governor's um, equity initiative or perhaps FERC itself um, to see about some kind of rulemaking proceeding or some other um, uh, way of positively getting rid of or eliminating this, um, this method of of analysis, which is actually not analysis at all, but actually an, an attempt to actually bury um, the impacts that are actually occurring um, by diluting them in a much longer pipeline train. In other words, we're buried with data that's irrelevant where no impacts are occurring, but not focusing on where the actual impacts are. And if you certainly were to add in, for example, the, um, the facility in Robinson County you would clearly see that that is a very big hot spot. So could you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, so with regard to segmentation, uh, people have raised the idea of segmentation both with the LNG plant and an associated pipeline called Line 434, which runs from Prospect to a brand new uh, gas-fired power plant in Richmond County, North Carolina, which is also coincidentally unrelated but happening at the same time. As far as I know, those segmentation charges are not part of the federal court cases that are happening right now. Um, the other part of your question was about the, the moving beyond the, the non-analysis. So I'm working with a couple of folks at NC State who are experts in the preparation of environmental reviews and environmental justice. Um, and those two colleagues are brainstorming together with me uh, what might a, an alternative to this analysis look like. And we're hoping to pitch a constructive alternative. To the, to the uh, we'd like to pick, pitch it to agencies like FERC, but I think it would be also appropriate to, um, uh, to pitch it to the EPA. EPA has, it still has a functioning environmental justice office um, we've had some of those folks come down and talk with our uh, tribal leaders back in 2017, uh, and they're still around, and they're still willing to listen to us at this point. So I work with indigenous social movements in Rapa Nui and the Easter Island in Polynesia, um, and I'd love to talk with you more about the indigenous consultation model. Um, it's you know, there's a lot of debate going on um, within Indigenous scholars about that that model and what it brings once you once you actually get to that stage. Um, thank you so much for coming here and sharing all this information. It's not your job to inform all of us about this, and I really appreciate you sharing your work. Would you talk a little bit about what maybe all of us could do to continue to kind of educate ourselves on these issues, to stay updated with what's happening and, and any other ways that we can get involved. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, as far, I, this, is the, this is the question that I fear the most. What can we do to get involved? Um, you know, there are, there are social and political ways that you can be involved, but I think a way that you won't hear from a lot of people is um, help us not to be erased. 
uh, by thinking about us as who we are today. You know, we're not, we're not people in the history books, and we're not these stereotypical images that you see. Uh, North Carolina has 120,000 plus indigenous peoples who live here. It's the largest population in the eastern United States. Uh, so when you hear narratives that that we're not here or that something's happening, but it's not affecting our lands, think about that with a little bit of skepticism and, and find out how they know, who they talk to to make sure that 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 they weren't affecting our our historical and cultural and environmental resources. Uh, dig a little deeper and see which tribal nations they spoke to. Um, building on that, I, I very much appreciate the opening um, where we where you talked about whose land are we on. I grew up in Orange County and Durham County uh, in this area and never heard that um, until you know well into my adulthood. Or I heard about Okanichi mostly from other things, but it wasn't made real. Um, and I also appreciate the pictures you put that were modern pictures, not just historical 200-year-old pictures. These people are gone, uh, sorts of things, as you said. Um, the question I have is uh, about uh, what you said about involving the tribes in the consultation. And where, um, being fairly new to the Atlantic Coast Pipeline discussion, where is the threshold where that kind of consult, um, where cultural resources, where in consulting you find out about the cultural, the harms to cultural resources, the harms to natural resources important to a tribe. Where is that threshold um, when you're looking at it from a federal regulator standpoint? Um, I used to work at EPA. I worked, uh, we uh, worked in the Air Office, so I wasn't in the, the other parts of it, but I understand that there are, you know, thresholds that have to be considered. For federally recognized tribes, there's a there's a fairly stringent process by which the regulators have to scrutinize the list in the federal register and and contact any tribe that might have a present day or historical interest, and they're supposed to get a yes or no response. No you know, proceed without us, or yes, you know, we want to have some level of involvement. And then when they say yes, discussion should start from there. This is a fraught process, and you alluded to this, the United States. There's a lot of criticism across Indian country uh, about how, how consultation is carried out, whether or not it's carried out in good faith, um, and, and what happens at the end of consultation. You just say, thank you very much, we're going to go do what we plan to do anyway, which is what federal agencies are, are allowed to do to this day. With non-federally recognized tribes, there's, first of all, there's no statutory requirement. The guidance is extremely ambiguous. It says that we recommend you engage with tribes that have a demonstrable interest in the area. And so I think that this case is pretty clear cut for demonstrable interest when one third to one half of your tribal citizens live within the study area, and, and you probably have a demonstrable interest. But I, I don't know where, that, where the line would be uh, for a, 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 a questionable case. So I haven't had, I haven't had to think about a, a non-clear cut case yet. Uh, thank, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering what you think some of the societal impacts the pipeline would have in Robertson County? Yeah, so this has been a topic of discussion in the county. Uh, and, you know, some people are, I think, rightly uh, concerned about things like having all, you know, workers coming from outside and spending so much time in the counties. They're not setting up the kinds of uh, man camps that we have in, in the plains. They're mostly staying uh, in cities like Fayetteville and Rocky Mount and places up in Virginia and coming down to work. But there are concerns and discussions about having so many uh, out of town workers coming and, and spending so much time in these communities. Uh, I think there's also a psychological uh, damage or harm that comes with just seeing your landscapes being uh, being torn up, being ripped up, 
Uh, and I've seen this happen in the Lumbee community of Prospect with the pipeline that, that's already being built. Um, there's, there's a lot of, um, uh, there, there's, uh, it, yeah, I, I can't say it's depression, but there's a, there's an ill feeling in the community that, you know, this is happening despite many of us not wanting it to happen. And, you know, it's just the same thing over and over again. You know, no matter, no matter how much we speak up, it's always going to, it's always going to go the way of the, the developers who have all the money. So the, the, the conversations that I hear focus on those things like the outside workers, but also on these harder to define and less tangible issues of, well, we're just repeating you know, the same historical injustices over and over again, and let's just shut down and not deal with it. So I'm tempted to ask you about the politics and ask if, uh, if it's okay for, would you be uh, able to share some of your attempts to speak with the governor and the DEQ about this issue. Thank you. Yeah, North Carolina officials have, have I think, tried to, to be allies to us. Um, I did have a conversation with the governor's uh, energy policy advisor a little over a year ago, and he was very receptive. Um, yeah, but, you know, you, you have nice conversations, and then you kind of wait and see what's going to happen. And you can tell by the fruits of those, those decisions whether or not anything hit home. I think the good news is that uh, Native people are on the state of North Carolina's regulation radar in a way that they have never been before. To my knowledge, this is the first time that, that DEQ is, has had any extensive interactions, for good or for bad, uh, with tribal governments over a major uh, environmental permitting issue. It was also the first time that all of the state's tribal leaders sat down together with state and federal officials to talk about any environmental issue. And in August of 2017, the state's leaders gathered in Hollister, uh, at the Hollowasaponi Tribal Headquarters, and had, a, they called it an environmental justice summit, uh, but it was, uh, it was a meeting to, to share concerns about the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, uh, to hear from EPA officials, from the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Everyone was there except the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the main body that was making decisions on the matter. Um, yeah, but things are happening, and it's encouraging to see, to see tribal leaders speaking out in a way that they haven't uh, spoken out before on these types of topics. So that's encouraging to me. So I'm really fascinated by your Monte Carlo simulation, yeah. probability distributions. Um, and so it's, did you run those at the track level, the block group, or the block? And do you see different results looking at the different levels? Yeah, so the census has all of these different hierarchical levels uh, of organization. And I, I decided from the get-go that I'm going to play by federal regulators' rules. So whatever they use, I'm going to use. They use census tracts. So I use census tracts. They use counties for their reference areas. I made virtual counties for my reference areas because I didn't want anyone accusing me of, oh, well, the only reason you get different answers is because you're using different data. No, I'm using the exact same data uh, that you're using. I'm just showing you how you forgot to these weighted averages. So, but yeah, you could, you could probably do a better job by taking this down to the block or to the block group uh, and sussing it out a little more. Um, I'm not a demographer. Um, so my, my, my ability to invest deeply in this was somewhat limited, but I am a modeler and I do a lot of Monte Carlo simulation. If I can do one thing good, it's build Monte Carlo simulation. <laughs> so. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the impacts from natural disasters to indigenous communities. Thanks. So natural disasters like hurricanes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was, there was a tremendous amount of flooding in the city of Lumberton during both Matthew and Floyd. Uh, interestingly, a lot of neighborhoods that were flooded during Hurricane Matthew and Floyd, and uh, not Floyd, Florence and Lumberton, were um, African-American neighborhoods. And this is because of the, the, his, the course of development of Lumberton. Um, it, 
and it, this plays out in cities all over, you end up with things like redlining or um, lower value land. And, and that land in some places ends up being where predominantly African-American communities are located. And we see this in places like Princeville, which is across the Tar River from Tarboro. Princeville's one of the oldest predominantly African-American towns in the region. And it was built there because after the Civil War, freed slaves were given land across the river, but that land was a floodplain, right? And so we see similar things play out in Lumberton. Uh, during Hurricane Florence, because of the storm track, there's actually a second flood pulse that came down the river and, and got backed up because of all the flooding in Lumberton. And it made flooding more intense upstream around Pembroke and the UNC Pembroke area flooded worse during Florence than during Matthew. And now there's a discussion in the Lumbee community about the extent to which we need to rely on an, on expanded artificial drainage networks to protect against these types of storms. Traditionally, our people dealt with storms by not building our houses in the floodplain. It was just common sense, right? But we, we've adopted this colonial mindset of we can ditch and drain and create more buildable land. And now we're, kind of, we're stuck with, the, with this infrastructure that's in low-lying areas and more prone to flooding now than it was a generation ago. And we have to figure out whether we're gonna stay in this colonial mindset of dominating the natural environment or whether we're gonna figure out another way out of this. One problem with this is that the higher ground in Robinson County and surrounding areas is now being overtaken by concentrated animal feeding operations, which when they went in, perhaps there were no houses in the stink radius, but now you've you've made this large radius of land in which nobody wants to build a house. So you're stuck between a stinky place and a wet place, and there's very little room for human infrastructure now. When that pipeline was being built, it was like a giant, a giant uh, cut through your body. It, was, it just snaked everywhere. And now what we're left with is large patches of crush run stone. Uh, I don't know why they put it there, but uh, just at the most unusual spots, you'll have a heavily um, rock filled area right in the middle of a field, or you will have a kind of a sinkhole. And with all the rain, it looks like you know you did, you got a pond view, but you didn't you didn't rent <laughs> you didn't rent a house with a pond view, or you didn't buy a property with a pond view. Yeah. And some of my own relatives, their properties are just sponge. You know they use they were farming it perfectly well. Now, what happens now that that, uh, that land has been disrupted as it has been? Because I can match 30 miles from west to east of my relatives who, whose land has that pipeline snaking through it. And uh, I, I don't understand how they're going to continue to farm it. Well, one thing is clear. You can't put it back the way that it was. Once you've excavated six feet of soil, and you put it back in the hole, you've destroyed the structure of that soil. And so you, you can actually see this from satellite imagery. I can go into, I can look at satellites in Google Earth, and I, you can see exactly where all of these pipelines run because the land in the eastern part of the state is darker, it's wetter, and it shows up because it's wetter. And you can see exactly where these pipelines cross farm fields, when your land is so flat and so close to the water table, as you compress and compact that soil, you're, you're increasing the likelihood that, it, that it's going to flood or be swampy or, or have these other impacts. The, the dumped gravel is probably so that their machinery wouldn't sink into the soft soil. So, but yeah, it's, as far as what you, what you do with that after the fact, I mean, you've, you've permanently altered the structure of that farm. And so that gash, even though the pipeline is buried, you still have you still have that gash of, of impaired compacted soil across the farm.
Well, I'm sure we are all incredibly grateful for your presentation today, Dr. Emanuel. And um, if you can all uh, join me one more time in thanking Dr. Emanuel for this wonderful talk. <laughs>